so yeah, we have a special uh, session today, and so uh, thanks for coming to this workshop. Um, so basically, I think that is also a good time for us to uh, explain to you and share with you people we met in this field um, and which projects we were working on, and basically to do an update uh, on our, our job. And the thing is that last year we met uh, kind of a lot of people. Uh, we had this release plugin initiative, release plugin framework, and that was the a good opportunity to just meet, meet developer and work with developer for building plugins. Um, so this is kind of this workshop is kind of uh, focused a bit on the Remix plugin, but we also uh, worked a lot with the Grid team uh, for having like a Remix desktop application, uh, and we had also some nice talk with Christian, which is just over there. So yeah, so that. Uh, I will go quickly around uh, with the with the schedule today. So I will do first a quick introduction. Let me fix that. <laughs> okay, that's <laughs> okay, <but> <laughs> so um, I will go uh, around just a quick introduction on uh, Remix. But I guess uh, some of you already know it or used it. So which, who here already used it? Can you just yeah. Was that good? So I, maybe I can just skip the first part. <laughs> uh, so then, uh, Ryan is here, he's part of the grid team, and basically uh, we work with the grid team for having this uh, Remix uh, desktop app. And then it was also a good opportunity to see how we can integrate uh, Remix with grid. So, um, for having like uh, a better uh, dev environment for, for developers. So uh, we will talk about that. Then uh, we have Christian Leisner here. Uh, so I think we, you might have already talked about this in the previous workshop. Everything is uh, about publishing data and source code to APFS and then verifying it. So um, Christian will talk about how uh, we plan to have uh, distributed at this uh, contract verifier. Uh, I think that's a big step uh, that we have to reach at some point. Then we have yeah, the famous how to build Remix in five minutes. So there is no five minutes here because I'm not sure it will. You it will? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So basically it's kind of, it's very easy now to develop plugins. Uh, and then we want to share with you how to do that and how it can be now easy to, to uh, develop and to test plugins. Uh, so moving uh, towards the plugins framework, uh, we would like to present to you uh, two plugins that uh, we were developing with with developers. Uh, so we have the Socrates plugins. Uh, I think you might already know about Socrates. It's basically Zikin's Snark on Ethereum, and we have now a plugin that Dev can use for writing uh, Socrates code and for um, testing it and for deploying it and for basically doing all the stack of the use of uh, the of the Kisnark on, on Remix then. Um, and then when, since four months we are also not working on workshops and we have now a plugin uh, which can be used for creating and for doing workshop. So Chris Ward will explain us a bit what is this plugin and then how this plugin can be kind of integrated inside um, all the educational stuff that we are doing in the EF. And then, oh, okay, sorry. Got it. So, and then we'll have uh, a brainstorm session with uh, uh, nice people that are here now. Thanks for coming. Uh, Rob Stupé. Jen Pitt, uh, Alex Bernstein, Felix Lange, Edson Akala, uh, Escala, sorry, Francois Gézangar here, and Nick Jorgita. Uh, so basically, we have this plugin uh, initiative framework, which is quite centralized now. So we are deciding which plugin can get in and which plugin should get uh, out. 
and we are auditing the code and basically we are maintaining everything and we don't want to do that for long so we want to find a way to centralize this so the question is uh, should we keep it centralized should we centralize it and how how we through and there is a bunch of questions uh, we need to answer with that so yeah we will try to figure out maybe one one step today so thanks do we need to do the first part? No? Um, yeah, so who does not know Remix at all? Okay, so <laughs> thanks. So let's move to the second part then. And yeah, Brian, please. Yeah, so. So it's great and thanks. project this year, uh, we were working on Mist, and Grid is kind of uh, an evolution of the developer experience. So we like to think of Grid as um, bringing Ethereum to your OS, and what we wanted to do is, with all these kind of CLI-based apps, build um, a unified UX that developers can rely on to uh, run Ethereum tools and um, nodes that make things a little easier. I think we've all experienced between running Geth and Parity, like the flags are different, and you always have to turn toward the documentation. So this is kind of how we, we uh, introduce it. <laughs> Simple as that. So when you start Grid, uh, it starts as a menu bar app. Um, if you don't have it installed, um, any of the plugins when you turn it on. Uh, there's a one-click start that downloads the release. Uh, this is what Grid looks like. Uh, the About page starts with uh, links to documentation and information about the plugin. Um, we have a version list that we're really excited about that helps you kind of switch between different versions uh, really quickly. Can we turn around to speaker maybe? Yeah. Uh, let's turn around. Turn around. Yeah, there's feedback. Should I stand somewhere else? Better? Better? Yeah, it was. Okay. It's okay. I can talk about that. So, um, so with Grid, we tried to build like sensible defaults. Uh, you saw kind of the settings page that we went through. Uh, it helps you kind of understand the kind of range of the, the features and functionality. Uh, and then when you turn it on, this is the, the terminal console output um, all in one place. And then uh, at the top we have a node indicator that kind of tells you where your node is, the syncing status, what block you're on, to give you like a visualization of, of where you're at. So we like to think of Grid kind of um, a mix between like an app store and a launch pad, meaning app store is around discovery, um, securely installing, knowing where things come from, making sure checksums are, are proper. Uh, Launchpad, easy to configure, zero friction to run, um, all like in one place in one home. The ecosystem's evolved a lot. You know, we started with just a few different types of uh, nodes and clients, and now there's blocks and blocks. So Grid is based around plugins. Um, there's a plugin architecture, and you know, uh, as you saw through the, uh, the preview, kind of. These are all the types of things that we are trying to bring into one unified interface uh, to make kind of the developer experience uh, easier and more unified. Uh, these are some of the plugins we have now. 
And uh, now I'll do a little demonstration of how Grid can make uh, working with Remix a lot easier. Um, so, we actually initially developed Remix as a Grid app, but then when they wanted to develop their own uh, Remix standalone app, we thought it was a, a really great way to kind of show um, the interoperability between, between these things. So, um, in Grid, down here for, uh, for this dem demo, uh, we're using the flags uh, dev uh, to connect uh, Remix to a Grid uh, uh, get dev instance, uh, opening the RPC API, and then also um, opening up the, uh, with this here, we're opening up the debug um, set of endpoints so we can uh, step through and, and see. So we'll turn on GEF. We're also going to turn on IPFS, because Remix has some great IPFS integrations. So here, demon is ready. So our goal with Grid was to, you know, just clicking these switches is a lot easier than going to the terminal and remembering kind of bring up documentation, remembering all the things you have to uh, configure. Um, with Grid, everything's kind of saved. So in your previous state, you just open it back up and you're you're back where you're at. So this is the Remix uh, desktop app. It's new. Uh, electron based and it's really great to have Remix kind of in a, in a format where you can open on your desktop. So, first I'll show um, deploying this contract, uh, the, the example valid contract to the, the developer instance of, uh, of get that we started in Grid. Well, so now I'll show how you can, um, so when we started Geth, one of the settings we had was to open up the RPC API, so here we'll use the Web3 provider to connect to the default port, 8.5.5, um, it's now connected, and then if we were to deploy the contract, that's here, it's like went through, if you go back to grid, you can see in the terminal here, uh, so mind the block with that transaction. Debug interface. So if we set a delegate and then move to the debug down in the bottom here. So here you can see Remix in its debugging mode now you're talking to Geth and you can walk through the, the code and see uh, the status for each. So that's exciting. And then kind of as a last step, if you wanted to publish your contract details on IPFS here, 
publish on IPFS. Uh, right now, the way the uh, app is set up is it will publish it to the inferior gateways, um, the IPFS server held at the, in the Berlin office, and also if you're running a local node, it will publish it to a local node. So now if we go um, oops, get that patch to show that it's now being hosted on my local node that I've started with grid, you can do So what this shows here is that uh, in your local uh, references of your hashes, uh, it has the um, the contract details. So yeah, that's good. Good thanks. So please, Christian, can you go? <laughs> So now we uh, take a look at uh, how this contract verifier can work. Do you need something? A browser? A browser? Okay, then. Sure. can you just show me how this is being ahead? Yeah. So you just use the button publish on this world company here? That's correct. Right. Um, the thing is, it's a tiny button, but it's part of a big mission. And uh, the big mission is to make Lutaris happy. You see it here. <laughs> because uh, almost uh, four years ago, he the first thing he did in the Ethereum space was developing a feature for the Solidity compiler that no one is using. <laughs> and I want to change that. <laughs> Okay, um... How do I switch applications in this one? You can use my laptop. Can you use that browser here? Want to click on it? Are there any... <laughs> <laughs> So uh, this is a condensed version of a longer talk I gave at the interview meet a long time ago. Almost there, almost there. What is full screen shortcut here for this problem? <coughs> F11? Oh, that was nice. Okay, um, I'll skip some stuff here. And so, when you are work using MetaMask currently to um, to confirm a transaction, to sign a transaction, it shows a screen like that. And it's terrible. It has been planned from the very beginning to show something very different here, but as I said, uh, this has not happened. Um, so you know what, why it's terrible, right? Or don't you think it's terrible? <laughs> so, <laughs> it's terrible. Okay, good, good. Because these are the reasons why it's terrible. Um, okay, and so the way to change this is uh, bytecode metadata, and this is one of the things that are published in Remix when you click on this publish IPFS, publish on Swarm. And it has been a feature of Solidity since 047, and it's mostly unused, as I said. And so if you take a look at the contract bytecode, then the end of the deployed bytecode always contains this uh, metadata hash. Uh, it's not at the end here because that's not the deployed bytecode, that's the creation bytecode, which also contains the constructor parameters at the end. And if you, so uh, this is a so-called CBOR encoded uh, uh, data, 
and if you decode it, it decodes into this here. So, and so it, it contains a swarm hash and the version of the Solidity compiler, uh, binary or kind of byte encoded. The first byte is the major version, the second byte is the minor version, the third byte is the patch version. So, um, only looking at the bytecode, you already know what the Solidity version used to compile this was. Um, but more important uh, is the this swarm hash we have here. In the future, this will also be an IPFS hash, but currently we're using Swarm. And if you follow this uh, hash to the file it hashes from, you get the so-called metadata, and uh, it contains the full version of the compiler, the language used, it contains uh, the, the full ABI of the contract, uh, it contains the developer documentation, and it, call, it contains the user documentation, also known as if you natural language specification that's fair. Um, and uh, this is an example where yeah, it's a function called renounce ownership, I think it's from, from ENS, and the documentation says renouncing to ownership will leave the contract without. So it tells you what the function does if you call it. And that is the string that has to be shown to the user when they sign the transaction. Um, and the ABI that is also there allows you to decode the, so to take this long hex string and decode into uh, values that make sense to the user. Um, oh, there's even more. Uh, <laughs> uh, namely, all the things you need to have to recompile the smart contract. All the settings that went into the, into the compiler when it was run. Um, and uh, also hashes to the source files that we use. So the, the catcher cache, the swarm hash, and the IP of the set. And, um, yeah, that's what I just said. And uh, I, so the problem is that uh, we have all this data, it is cross-linked, but the problem is it is not available. People do not publish it. Um, and even if they publish it, for example, using this uh, button in Remix, publish to Swarm, publish to IPFS, uh, it will not stay there because Swarm and IPFS are not there yet to keep files. And because of that, I want to start an initiative to um, yeah, create a service that just uh, keeps those files um, yeah, on IPFS. So all the source codes that are uh, correspond to deploy contract on the chain. And once you have that service, and once this data is available, you can run this tiny script here, and you don't see that the script is tiny, but it is, and when it runs, you, you, you give it the address of a smart contract, that's the first hex string, and the second hex string are the, the parameters that are, for example, shown in, in MetaMask. And then it, it goes, it first retrieves the bytecode. From the bytecode, it retrieves this metadata hash. Then it retrieves the actual metadata file from Swarm. And in that file, there are IPFS and Swarm links to the source code. It retrieves the source code. And then it downloads the matching compiler that was used uh, when this contract was compiled. It recompiles everything, checks that it results in exactly the same bytecode. And then it uh, takes a look at the data that is uh, present as the second string here, and looks up the function that is called in the NUT spec and the ABI, and tells you what it will do. And uh, yeah, so this is the service I would like to build. I'm not sure if I should go into detail because it's not fully unrelated to remix. <laughs> um, but I think it will be fun, and I hope we can get to a situation where, for example, MetaMask and of course all other wallets do not look like the one on the left here, but rather on the right, where you uh, where you see which function you're calling and what it will do and what it will do. Okay, that's it. Thanks. Do you want to have some? So. This needs a cooperation between um, people who are writing deployment tools, people who are uh, working on wallets, 
and people are working on block explorers and if you want to help in some way, also if you want to help uh, working on this service that publishes stuff, uh, please talk to me. I have a question. Yeah. The information that is stored in IPFS includes the in and source code? Includes what? The information that you store in IPFS includes the in and source code? Yes. Yeah. Um, Right, thanks. So let's let's uh, start talking about um, plugging some Remix and um, that's NCC. I think we uh, did the first presentation about uh, those plugins uh, with the new interface. Uh, so uh, yeah, I hope you you like the new interface. You haven't seen it yet. And uh, you have a preview of the new logo of Remix, by the way, uh, with uh, Remix Desktop, so if you have it, um, this is quite new. And today, uh, who here have built plugins in Remix already? One, two, three, four, nice, great. So, for those who haven't, I just want to take five minutes to show you how easy it is to actually build the plugins uh, with Remix, so I just want to be sure, do you hear me at the end? Yeah, perfect, great. Um, so, I want to I, I want to show you, uh, I'm doing it the right way, so I will clear um, uh, local storage, okay, there are clear everything here in my uh, browser. Uh, well, okay, that's good. Um, here, okay, I have a clean workspace. Okay, nothing here, no files. Um, I will start running the clock and after five minutes you'll have a running plugin <laughs> on my computer. Okay, so uh, just for letting you, last time I did it I failed, so I do not have pressure on me. Okay, so, okay, let's go. So, uh, plugins on Remix work inside an iframe, so basically what you need is an index, uh, index.html file. So, let's create it. Um, you can try to do it at the same path as you want. I just created the index.html file because I just developed it. So what I'm going to do now, um, I'm going to go on um, github.com slash ethereum from remix dash plugin, which is the library we build to interact with remix. So we have an npm package, but for the sake of the, demo sake of the demonstration, I'm going to use the CDN. So here I will pass the CDN, I'll create a script, and go back to the documentation. And from here, it says that um, I need to create what we call a client. Basically, a um, class is going to call to talk from the iframe to Remix ID. So I'm doing that here. And then I'm going to create an async function called say hello. So my plugin is basically going to create a new file on a Remix file system and display hello world because yeah, that's the easiest thing to do. So, for that, I'm going to look at the documentation again. So here you have everything that you need to know about this. And here you have all the, um, the native plugin that we expose. So here, which native plugin should I use to write something on the file system? Come on, time is running out. <laughs> Try manager, okay. Let's go, so I go there. And here I have all the methods that are exposed. I won't ask you this time. Um, so first I need to wait that the client is actually uh, loaded. And then I will do clients.call. This is to call the file manager. And then here I will give the method, which is set file. Uh, file is going to be inside browser slash palette.hello.txt. Uh, so, and it's going to say hello. Work. And then I'm going to do the same and just um, change the file um, so we can see it directly. So switch file. Oh, I'm going to make a mistake here. Hello, the text here. Perfect. And now I just need a button to trigger the function. And by default, we inject um, we inject uh, Bootstrap. So just for you to know, you don't even know need to inject it because we want every plugin to look the same. So just say say hello. So now I will run npx live server. Go back to Remix. Here inside File Manager, I can connect to a local plugin. And here I give the name of the plugin. It's a 
Uh, camera face, say hello. This is the display name, say hello. HTTP proposed 8080. Okay. Seems okay for me. Go to side panel. Okay. Here I have my new plugin that is alright. Is alright. I have my say hello with the bootstrap theme. I click here. Ask me because it's file system. You don't want to give access to everything here. I want to accept it. Tells me and accept it. Bam! I did it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry? The show is done yet. Yeah, it's done. Yeah, now I have some experience. But this one I was working on it because last time was very uh, yes, for me. Okay, so I really wanted to show you how easy it is to connect with this. Of course, this is a hell of work. Okay, you, have, uh, you can use whatever framework you want. Uh, we have example with uh, React, Vue, Angular, Lit Element, whatever you want. If you need more example, we can build some for you. Um, to show you how it, um, how it works. And also, with this uh, plugin, you can um, call. So this is like all documentation, but um, all those are exposed by default. And we also have a new way, which is like external APIs. For example, we have this Freebox plugin built by Pierre here. And it exposes all the Freebox uh, interface direct needs I remix. So even your plugins can extend the Remix uh, API in this kind of thing. And um, I, and I, I want to talk a little bit about this project. Um, so everything um, about this plugin engine that we are building, and <coughs> I want to say that it's actually a, a two layer of uh, interoperability. Um, so this is how it works right now. You have Remix ID, you have the plugin engines that run inside it, and then you can plug any plugins you want, so it's like type of plugins. But what we really want to do, that's anyone, any project that wants to build decentralized application or ID can use actually this uh, plugin engine. And we, we made everything possible so that uh, any project that has a web view, because it's still iframes, can uh, create, uh, integrate Remix engine. And we really want to um, make an open call to anyone that wants to try to use this plugin engine, um, <coughs> please come to us. So like that, if you build the plugins, it's not going to work only on Remix, it's going to work on all the, the applications that are running this uh, plugin engine. But if we go a little bit deeper, so that was the first step, uh, application layer, but we want also to be able to have like an API layer, because if, if we have a wallet, we're gonna have like a lot of wallet, right? So what we want to do is, we don't want the plugin developer to say, okay, I just want to my plugin to work with MetaMask or to with this wallet in specific. We want them just to say that, I want to work with a wallet, and then it's up to the user to choose which wallet they want to use. And for that, we are working on a, a common a, a API and common interface, so that um, it's, it should be like, totally uh, agnostic for the user when they are uh, to the developer of plugins if they want to integrate to add um, a wallet like that. So the idea is that you can of course use MetaMask but you could use also whatever wallets you want. And this is our next step and we really appreciate any project that work on this kind of um, standardization of uh, interfaces because we really want to be able uh, to accept a lot of uh, different uh, plugins and try to make it as uh, interoperable as possible. So, thanks to you. And now I think this is Socrates plugin. So, please, welcome.
Uh, hi guys, uh, my name is Sethi and Darko here will help me with the, the worship part later on. Today the idea is to showcase Zocritus plugin. These amazing guys too have created Zocritus implementation itself and we brought it to Remix so you can hack and play with it. Basically the idea is to make this uh, the usage and the creation and the verification part as easy as possible. So you as a Solidity dev or dev that isn't familiar with ZK Snarks in depth can use this and test it on the Remix plugin. So basically we are going to take a look at the user perspective here. Uh, you wrote, what do you do? Uh, you actually write high level code, you compile that code, and what you get is a set of conditions or the flattened code. Next, we can have two steps, either setup or compute with test, but in this demo we are going towards setup, we generate a proof and a verification key, and then from that verification key you get the uh, verification smart contract that we are going to deploy on JavaScript VM, yeah. or inside the Remix, and on the other side we can create a witness from the flattened code and so on, but I will show you that. Also, for those who want to track, you can open your laptops and just open Remix, so you, we can test together this. So basically, let's go. It's a bit hard to track, but okay. So basically what uh, we are going to do, we are going to activate three plugins. First one is Zocritus, the second one is Solidity Compiler, and the third one is the Loy and Reference Sections. Oh, okay. Oh. Okay. Thank you, I have a special hostess you know, here. Thank you for it. A big applause for him, please. So now when we activated this plugin, we are going to show you a simple example. So we are going to click on an example file, accept all that the room is from, from us. So basically, I've probably given my kidney away, but oh, it's okay. <laughs> so here we have an example of the code. Uh, what this code does is actually pretty, pretty simple. You see this code. Is it okay? From micro, okay, awesome. So we have two fields, private field A and public field B. Uh, private and public will be important later on, we will, we will say uh, what that means. But basically, result is, if A times A equals B, then it's one, else it's zero. So basically, E squared is equal to B, and we'll see if that is true or not, or that is zero or, or uh, one. <coughs> so basically, the first step, as we mentioned before, is the compilation. So from this high level code, we'll let uh, flatten a set of conditions. We're going to use the compile, you get this. Basically, we can copy that bait code or download it if you want to use it uh, offline. This version is also compatible with the C CLI, so you, you can take this, this what you generated here, and, and move it to the CLI. Uh, once we did this compilation, we got this, this uh, flattened code. What we'll do next, next is the setup. I won't get into too much details now so, because I just want to show high overview, then we can later talk about what each set, what each step does. But what uh, setup will create is two keys, verification and proving key. Uh, we are going to that, run that part and here we can see that we gain two keys, that is proving and verification key, that we are going to use later on. So on this setup part, uh, we have generated that. And the next step in this, if I'm going too fast, just stop me and ask. So it's really just just do that. Uh, and on the next step, we are going to generate the solidity contract from this verifier. Uh, I'm going to use ABI version 2 because it's the latest version and Zorkadis is moving towards that. So we are going to use that. And we are going to do the export. What we just done here is we have created uh, so we have the contract that we can deploy and then verify using it. Uh, this is an average contract and what we are going to talk about now is this verified transaction because it's important. So basically here we've generated 
a contract that we are going to de deploy and we are going to send a proof and two new ends to that contract. So input parameters and the proof itself. So let's deploy that, that to, let's first compile it, of course. It will take some time. I hope the internet is good. And once it's compiled, we are going to deploy the side JavaScript PDM. Is this too fast for you, or is this okay? Okay, awesome. So basically, we are going to take this contract verify and deploy it here. So here we have just one function verify transaction where we are going to input some stuff that we are going to generate in the next step. So basically, just to recap uh, quickly, we had this high-level code which we compiled we run the setup, which generated proving a verification key, and from verification key, with export verify, we gain this smart contract, which we deployed in our JavaScript VM, and now we are going to do this part on the left. So basically, on this part, compute witness does what it does is basically from this uh, input uh, argument, uh, it generates the field that you can input values inside here and as we can see this is a private field so private field A is private and that would be important because of the privacy feature of the ZK snarks that in the next step we'll see we'll see how so basically we'll say uh, can you, someone give me an example of which number square is some other number 416 416 okay awesome. so 416 here Oh, not 15, 16, yeah, let's compute that. Okay, so basically the witness is computed, and we are going to generate the proof now that we are going to use there. But first, let's open that, that proof, open it here, and we get, we get something like this. So ZK Snarks works that, that way that this, these three points are elliptic curve points for ZK Snark, and these are the inputs inside. As we have seen on the compute witness, we can tap here. Okay, this may be a bug, it's alpha, so sorry for it's that. Ah, it's actually that's my okay. So, yeah, that's okay then. So basically, yeah, I thought this was a bug. So, yeah. <laughs> so basically, as we can see in the inputs, what we have here is only 10, which is 16, this B part, and we have one, which is the result of the function, but we don't have four anywhere. Why? Because it's the privacy feature of the ZK snarks. So basically, we don't have to show the private fields in this proof to be able to verify the proof itself. So basically, that's it. And now we are going to take that generate proof, copy those parameters, take them here, and verify the transaction. Let's run that. Let's wait a bit, it will take some time. Yeah, we can add, we can take gas profile, so we'll see about to work. Yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it will depend a bit. Oh, okay, I'll submit fast. Now let's open it. And we go down there to the code table, and it says true, so we managed to verify the book. So basically, that's, that's the short flow, the high overview of it. Uh, what would happen if, for example, if we did this? So, four times. Four times four is sixteen. But what we say? What if we said that it's nine? What will happen? We can compute witness. We can generate the proof. Let's then again copy the parameters, and let's verify that transactions. Transaction. Let's wait a bit to show you here on this part. It's waiting. Yeah, it's, it, yeah. It. it it takes a lot of time, but it works. Basically, now we will again verify that that it's true. But what is actually true? We verify as we make it open this. Let's open the Remix 72. That 4 times 4 and 9 as a result is not equal. So basically, we have again verified that we know the prior fields of this. So basically, even if it doesn't satisfy, even if 4 times 4 isn't 9, if we say that it's invalid, then we verify this, so basically, you don't need to have, you know, it's not just arguments that 
that satisfy this condition are two that are one, but also those that, that satisfy zero as a result can also be a verification of this. So basically that's it for sure. You have any questions or should I go into some detail, some spark? Yeah. Does it show like a single highlighting or like if there will be an error in the Socrates file itself? Does yeah, it like, yeah, we can make an error. Let's, 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 let's do it like this. So let's make result, that's the completion again, and this says that our result is undefined and stuff like that, we can do something else. But basically, uh, you will get a line where uh, where it's the error, so basically that's how the split works. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah? Um, does this run inside Remix or are you yeah. conducting an external? Yeah, it's a completely inside Remix. It's yeah. WASM based, so it's all inside Remix. So it's written Rust, so you can call that web assembly. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, there is one version that is CVI, it's multi threaded and CVI uses multi threaded version, and this is single threaded because it's in JavaScript. So basically, this is a bit slower, but it's more user friendly, and for this kind of testing, it's pretty good. Okay, any more questions? Yeah, you got how much gas? Oh, okay. Yes, for fun, okay. Please also try with optimizer. Yeah, we can run it. Debugger plug in. Okay. Yeah, probably add some, yeah. So we have to make Which one needs to activate also? Debugger plug in. Ah, yeah. Okay. Five hundred six seven thousand. So yeah, yeah, that's okay. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. fun fact, it's going to be much better after Istanbul. So we see basically a third of it as a cost. Yeah, so that's basically. It. If you have any more questions, feel free to ask us later on. And thank you, guys. Now we have two items left. Uh, we talked about uh, the Remix workshop plugin with Chris Wong. And, and then we can switch to the brainstorm session where we talk about how to curate a plugin list and how to add more consolidation on, on our plugins. Okay. But first workshop. Yeah. It's time to set them.
but if we want to do what Joe Luton described as the next million devs, then it is very important. Um, so one thing I've always been a big fan of is documentation that people can also interact with. Uh, and that's kind of what the workshop plugin lets you do. So this is somewhat limited right now, but there is this new workshop plugin you can activate from the home page too. Um, and we will start adding curated workshops to this, um, but also you can create your own. So where we see the internet is, you can either manually create them by adding steps and then linking to files, and I'll show you the structure of that in a minute. But that's a little bit tedious, so one of the other steps now is to import right from GitHub and follow a certain uh, pattern, and that's what I'll quickly show you. So, in the Solidity documentation is this introduction to smart contracts example. And one thing I tried to do was recreate this as a workshop plugin. Uh, and if you've ever used any kind of interactive education tool before, then you have things like, I'll show you very quickly, description, the code to play around with, and then you test what you've done, and if it's correct, you go to the next step. If it's wrong, it tells you what's wrong, you fix it, etc., etc. This is currently using the um, kind of error handling feature of Solidity, things like uh, revert and, uh, require and assert. So we can't test at the moment, but Francois has promised me we're going to look at other ways to figure out how to test some of that stuff. Um, for example, in this smart contract example, it tells you about the fragment version. We need to figure out a way to, to test that, for example. Um, but, and it basically looks like something like this. If this gets too slow, I'll switch to a local copy. Each step is defined in a folder. Uh, and the, the file name is important, especially if you want to import from GitHub, because then it will just match all the files it needs from that file name. And if I jump into one that is a little bit more, has everything in there, you'll see uh, a markdown file which contains the text, uh, the text you just saw. Could you please increase a little bit the yeah. size? But it's also tiny here. <laughs> I can barely see what I'm doing. So. Is that better? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. So, there's a markdown file that has the explanation. And one thing I will say for anyone who's interested in this, writing, um, converting like normal documentation to something like this that's very bite-sized is actually really, really hard. Um, so actually possibly the hardest bit of this is figuring out how to explain in very few words concepts in that side panel. And I wouldn't say this is, this is still too long. It probably needs a bit more work, but it's actually quite difficult. Um, and then you have the basic uh, Solidity file. Don't forget, this should be the Solidity file without the thing that you want people to add. So it's kind of its current state. And then here is the test. And at the moment we have a little bit of a... Uh, we need to figure out how to test this properly because the, the explanation maybe introduces some concepts so you have something to test um, because you need something to test, which isn't always what you have when you're trying to educate. So this is things we're still trying to figure out. But, but if you have done any kind of error handling in Solidity, then this is reasonably familiar. Um, and yeah, the, the import file at the top is added by remix. So if you're using a, an editor, you'll keep getting errors about it. But it will get added eventually. And that's pretty much it. So actually just creating the content is probably the most complicated part of the whole thing. Uh, and then you get an interface much like you saw with the um, steps that people can work their way through and complete a course or complete a, a small workshop. And um, we have been testing this and Rob is, is going to run a workshop using this in, um, in Paris in about a month as well. So and we tried it at Berlin as well and it works quite well. So if you have uh, tutorials you would love to add in, please do and uh, let us know, or you can add them yourself and just run them. Um, and this sort of fits into a lot of other things we're trying to do. Um, I don't know if any of you saw in Aya's keynote, there was a little thing about studio.ethereum.org. 
dialogue coming soon. <laughs> so, um, that's actually a, a similar product to, to Remix called, that was built by um, a team in Spain uh, called Superblocks. And that adds the ability to also test things like the HTML and Web3 JS JavaScript to build a, a full stack DApp. But the nice thing is both of them are using Markdown uh, and smart contracts and then HTML and JavaScript in the case of Superblocks. So we can actually share content between them as well. And with the plugin infrastructure, the eventual aim in the long run will be to hopefully kind of make one uh, plugins of others sort of thing. So it's basically the same tool with extras on top. So yeah, um, that's just some of the things we're working on in terms of some interactive education tools. And hopefully in the future, we might also be able to make this embeddable somehow. I don't know. Um, so it can actually be directly in the documentation too. So yeah, please give it a go. Uh, we know there are some limitations right now, but it's certainly something to, to try and experiment with and figure out how to teach people the wonderful world of the Solidity <laughs> program. So, thank you very much. Thanks. Um, so now, uh, let's move to uh, the brainstorm session with Rob here. So basically now we want to discuss, and I think it should be like an open discussion. So uh, I would like you guys all to just raise your hands, and if you want to come, you can also come here. <laughs> to just exchange stuff and share ideas together. And the, the starting point of the discussion is about plugins, and to see whether uh, we need to keep it centralized, not centralized, and, and how we should then uh, over this and uh, what will be the brokers and etc. So yeah, please, Alex, you want to go? Uh, I think like it should be like everyone should be part of it. I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. Uh, please just come up here and then uh, talk with us. Okay, so I, I was sorry for a question for you. Yeah, everyone. So, so then I, I pose a question by the way. Why 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 does it need governance in the beginning, right? Is it, is, it, is, it, is it better just to have in the beginning just like a central trusted server with a few, few plugins? Yeah, that's a good question, but uh, I'm not sure I'm the right one to answer that. But I, I would say that you say it's the beginning, and I kind of thought it is not the beginning, and for me it was the right time to move to a decentralized movement. But it looks like uh, you think. Me, right, that's uh, need to wait so, more, and that's basically it's not the right time. So, maybe yeah, it's like maybe what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. 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 So <laughs> just just, just, just tell what, what, what we're yeah. discussing now. Okay, so uh, <laughs> maybe you can just introduce the thing. So, we have this remix plugin framework now, and uh, which means that any developer can uh, propose plugins and can uh, develop plugins. That's the case of Edgy uh, for the Zocrates plugin, and that's the case of Edson here uh, for the Gas Provider plugin. And so we know uh, those guys, that's fine. So <coughs> it's fine for, for us to have Remix, to have their plugin inside Remix, but if there is multiple people like coming and saying, okay, we want also to have this plugin, and we have this, uh, developed this plugin, and, and we want to have it in the Remix, and we're doing all this push to have, make everyone do a plugin, but are you doing a good plugin, or is it just a silly one, or is it a malicious one, or is it a... I have, yeah. a, I have a question. Oh. That's a question. So like, is Remix eating its own plugin dog food? Like, the Solidity compiler, is that what Remix is using? Um, or are you using the Solidity compiler plugin when you're compiling? Yeah, okay. so basically we have a bunch of plugins uh, made by us. Uh, like S dog plugin, it has been plugin, and we made this plugin. So, yeah. I would just. Uh, that was a question. Yeah. So just uh, to 
to Alex's question, I mean, given that it's in early stages, you want a refined list of plugins that actually work. Because the last thing that you want is a long list of things that do not work, and that's how no one can decide what to use. So we definitely need in day one, I would say, governance, just like with Ethereum. You can't just send free transactions. You need a cost with it. And then this cost is probably associated with governance more than anything else. I do have a technical question, if it's OK. But it's not related to the governance aspect. But one thing we're trying to add to our plugin is a field. So we have a get point. And the get point in the transaction accepts another field beyond what's defined in the regular transaction format that you have. So from to, we added an extra field that gets stripped out before it's sent to public mail. So is there a way to create a plugin that allows us to do that? Um, right now, I would say no, because I think it's something that's done directly inside Remix yes. uh, code, source code. Um, so this is one thing that we try to do is, uh, for us, still a concept, this plugin engine. Um, we want you to be sure that it's worth spending time on that, and I think it is because we have a lot of developers that are interested into it. But as you say, we are, most of the plugins are fake plugins right now because they're just like the file system, for example, and stuff like that is directly inside the code of Remix, and we need time to remove it and try to improve this kind of thing. So it's but it's going to be a, possible, but right now it's, it's not. Well, Zacharty's now is like it's also part of the Remix code? No, no, this okay. is a new. So that's an external plugin, and that's what yeah. I'm thinking, yeah. right? Yeah. I want to develop an external plugin that allows me to customize the list of fields that are being passed through. But run and run around transaction is still native, and it, we, we should probably extract this out so you can, uh, out so you yeah, can use it. But, yeah, but we, we don't have it now. I think this <laughs> conversation we're having right now is really interesting. It shows you that people actually want more API. Yeah. How do you govern that? Yeah, that's actually a good question. There's um, something that we are doing right now. We have open a, a GitHub uh, repository where we put uh, all the common API that we have right now. Uh, our goal, as I explained, um, is like to have common APIs. And this is actually more difficult than I thought at the beginning because there are already some, a lot of softwares um, the only standard API that I know right now is like the web free provider, which is the only thing on file system because you usually just know it. But everything else is like uh, super difficult to know. And we need like working groups of people from the industry to talk about that. But still, we need to not just talk, we need to produce something because you have this kind of, of, of issues. So the way we are doing right now is just taking the current API from Remix and putting, exposing it, just like that. And, uh, but I, I think it needs to be created at some point. So always the same proof of concept, and then we try to make it more standard as, as much as possible with all the people. Yeah. So we prefer, of course, like just a fill here. I prefer, even though there's others that might want to ask for new APIs, I prefer to send the new at the same same transaction, but customize the fields that can be passed through, because that makes it compatible with all the other um, clients and IDs, and we don't need to create something custom, especially if you have also an external API that's using it, or other applications, then we don't have to create them. Yeah, I, I have an opinion on that. I guess it would be nice to have a, a you know, to define a certain rules. If, if, for instance, I want to extend certain API, uh, let's say I'm using the TypeScript, uh, and I want to extend the types, so I probably define certain rules and you know, guidelines to, to do it easily. Yeah, so what kind of guidelines do you expect? Like something that's like inside, uh, that checked before putting it on, uh, for exposing the plugin, or is it uh, at runtime, or is it just guidelines on the documentation? Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, just for instance, if I'm a plugin creator, and then someone else is coming to create another plugin, and he wants to look into the code of my plugin. So everyone has different ways of doing certain things. But if you start like educating people, like, okay, you want to extend the types, or you want to do something else, you can do it in this way. So the mental model of the next person is going to be the same, that he's going to know what yeah. to do. Um, I have a question. How do you do it internally in your team when you propose 
new API or new changes? Like for example, this entire plugin system, how did, did you create a proposal and then you discuss it in your team? And no, basically it was like more, um, we take, as I explained, take the code that's currently used and we just expose it. No, I mean, uh, internally, how did you communicate that you're going to do this? It's not, um, for, the, for, for the API, it's more like, uh, for example, Ed Sol made a desk profile thing, and at some point, you will need to access the login information, right? So we told, told us, okay, uh, I want to be able to get the trace, uh, to have a new API for getting the trace, so we just say, okay, so we can just extract this uh, stuff from our code, and then we make an API for you to access it. I mean, it's more like uh, if one dev, one plugin dev wants a new API, we just see if it makes sense to have it, and then we just uh, it. Okay, so it's still very centralized. Centralized ad hoc. I know it's centralized, but you, when you're project management, you create a little sub-project for that. And how do you summarize what you want to do? It's not that formal, it's more like, what, is, what do we need okay. right now? Are you going to be able to do this if you open it up? Like if you open it up to the more community, is that the point? Too? And they're going to sit there and communicate with you. You're going to be in chat with them all the time, emails, and then you're going to make promises, or, or are you going to get so organize about proposals? Like make a proposal. Yeah. We'd like this proposal to comment, modify the proposal. You have to create more process, like the creating a branch on the GitHub, uh, on GitHub, to see if people want to comment the branch and uh, that kind of thing. Or whatever, yeah. I mean, we shouldn't solve it now, but you have to know yeah. that the more people you have involved, the, yeah. the more you structure. You can ask the plugin dev to like stake some it yeah. and the community can slash it. So should make it further. In fact, this proposal, and that could, that could fund security review. Actually, yesterday uh, I, we were speaking about it. Um, one of the things that Jan mentioned is like, okay, let's say I'm a developer. Uh, you go, you create a proposal, I want to create, I have this idea, so people can come, they can vote, uh, let's say automatically you will sign a budget from me, you know, a bounty or something. So this guy will be really but, but one of the things that Jan mentioned was, what about the long term maintenance? Uh, what is going to happen if, they, if this thing is not working? So uh, I, I like the idea about staking something. Maybe you can even tokenize a, a plugin, and uh, people can donate, uh, you know, things like that. Okay. Yeah, but people again, you, you don't want to create a huge thing to govern, uh, to, to, for governance, to govern like 50 plugins or 100 plugins, right? So it only starts making sense when you are talking about tens of thousands of plugins. Because if you have like under a thousand plugins, you probably can just use social functions. Just in the sense of like, I trust I trust him to review, I trust her to review, or the same thing like that. Mm. Maybe you should look at what other are doing for plugins. Like there is a plugin for Aragon, Yao, and Grid, Grid also use plugin. Um, for them it's also it's very internal. And I think we've reached the point that now um, we really need to know how, because right now if you want to add a plugin, you need to do a pull request on Remix ID. Um, we are trying to switch to something more um, external from us, so now you can just do pull request in another repository, so it doesn't touch our code, so it's like the first thing to extract from Remix ID. Um, but at some point we need to find a way have to validate everything. Um, that's that's how do we do that? Yes, you can use a plugin without registering it, right? So if I like publish one, and I just like to register it officially with you guys through this. Can you load it by low low Which local plugin? Yeah. You, you can use it locally, but you you can't. Does it have to be local host, or can I connect to like any URL? No, and you can. Yeah. Anything. Yeah. 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 But then it's more like for dev purposes, where right? you want to develop something. And yeah, because otherwise, every time you refresh, you have to continue with your own idea. But, but I, think, I think if I may say something here, that I kind of think that... Uh, so we started working on this thing to last year, just after that column uh, 4. And then, basically, I thought that it would have taken uh, less time to reach the point where we need to, uh, to, to put this more centralized. And 
yeah, I think it's a question of timing. Is it for me, it was the time to push this as you know, more centralized, I think. But it looks like uh, we have now 15 plugins. What's, it, what's that like to your team to have 15 plugins in Word? Sorry? What is it like for your team with 15 plugins? Is it a lot of work to review all that stuff? Like, what is that doing to your team? Yeah, I mean, how much work is that? Basically, AG is uh, doing the Zocatas plugin. Uh, at the moment, we don't review it. Because it's written, it's alpha version. We know it's not ready yet. So for my part, I'm maintaining five plugins, and uh, it's already a lot of work. And uh, it, and I review also its plugin, which is not even written. I mean, it's written in um, React. I don't know so much React, so you know like, this kind of issues that we've got. Um, and a lot of people don't know what what framework they're using. React, React too, okay, right? Um, but yeah, if, if we, like we have pipeline, pipeline is written in Vue. It's huge, huge code base. So it's super difficult for us to, to manage, maintain this kind of thing. And each time there is a new update, we need to review again. Because we don't want like these new updates will bring some new... Uh, yeah, every time they upgrade. Yeah, update. so it's probably uh, uh, Is it possible to make the uh, ID in a way that the plugins are sitting in a separate repository? And then anyone can just uh, get the remix and then just install the plugins. And then you have you don't need to maintain any plugins if it's that architecture. You just like uh, have a remix, someone gets the plugin, there is a plugin repository, then you don't need even to govern anything. So people are just like uh, willingly choosing whatever yeah. plugins mm -hmm. they want to install. And then those so, things are going away. So do you expect do you expect people to go to the repository and look at the code and say, okay, this is the good code? No, I, mean, I mean, I, I don't I, expect them to do that. I expect people to just have a look into the, like if it's like a highly valued or whatever the team has created and they trust this team, this is up to the, like, whoever is going to use this plugin to decide do they want to use it or not. So basically there is no, like, a single point of deciding. So it's like, uh, I mean, there are different signals. I don't know, like, Did you use a Q-Cures for that? Oh, Pios. Uh, like um, two weeks for validation of the plugins, jurors are iterating, and then if it's good, then the plugin is used in your, in your remix. I mean, it's made public. Yeah. And how can. So, so how, how can. So if I want to be part of. Uh, of Pios? Yeah. Uh, we have to engage like a Twitter. So, that if the case is. Uh, I mean, I'm not, not an expert of heroes, but I'm, I think it could be an, uh, an idea to deal with this mass needing of reviewers, uh -huh. because reviewers are earn money when they do and what for the good outcome yeah. of the case. So it could be a balance between uh, yeah. to have less work for them. I have a question. So I see the, what is the trend model, right? But I see two types of, of bad plugin, right? The first one is just a plugin that breaks, remakes for me, it doesn't work, and it sucks, makes everything slow, like, it, it's just a bad thing, and only affects me. The second contract motto is a bad plugin that actually changes the source code of the contract when it's deployed. Mm -hmm. But then you could argue that like, you should not use a contract, like, you, like the, the final thing that you should trust is the contract that is on the, like, on, on, on Etherscan, right, on, on, the, on the blockchain. You should go there and verify it there, right? So that's it shouldn't matter. So, it, so my point is, if you're using, if you make a contract, publish it on the on on publish it on the blockchain, then you should verify the source code there, not in your Linux local local thing. But yeah, the, the thing like the problem I see there, like you in some plugins have access to file system. And I, for example, use Zocrates, activate that plugin, and change some that I can access the file system. I, I can be malicious in the file computer. I and see. that are big problems. That, that you can test, because you can test source code of plugin, you can test how it works, but integration with other plugins or malicious stuff like that, that's, that's hard. That's, that's the biggest problem. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. In, in this scenario, it seems like we're still not clear on how which APIs we're going to enable, what sort of features we're going to enable. So it's in early stages. So before we start thinking about the threat models that we need 
to protect against. We probably need to define all of the features, at least a good number of features that we want to introduce and we start building. And then we can start thinking how we're going to protect against malicious problems. Yeah, I was going to say that, I'm, as I said, it depends a lot on the, what the plugins can actually do and what they have access. Even if it's limited right now, I think in the future it's going to be more and more. Because I think even things like the wall, it might make sense to expose it because there might be some plugins that do need access to it to implement some sort of functionality uh, in the future. And the threat model that really worries me is, is what we see in the ecosystems like uh, Chrome plugins and things like that, which is, is a plugin that gets really, really popular and someone just goes to the developer with a lot of cash and says, I want to buy it. And the developer just transfers. And then in the next update, there is like a, you know, there's a dozen one, one where it's sort of, I think this kind of thing that it, it's not really about if it's, you know, thousands of plugins, if it's like, 50, or it's already a lot for us to, uh, to you know, be able to review all that there, every update, and check what's, uh, mm -hmm. if there's anything malicious that was introduced. Um, finding a solution for that is a very interesting yeah. problem. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so yeah. basically now we are just, so before you can just update as you want, because we're just on the CDN. So now we are traditional Swarm, so we have to set the, on, um, sorry, like EFS, so we have a hash, so each time you update, this is a new hash, so at least we can know that the version is different, but just a way of warning people, it's not, um, don't go part of that, yes. Do you have in the world now, like, the concepts of monetizing those uh, obviously um, high quality plugins? Uh, we don't. We don't have any work done right now. For what you mean for? Uh, yeah, like a building a marketplace for those kinds of plugins. Uh, I think the monetizing is up to each plugin. For example, Mythix plugin has a freedom uh, version. Or you can log in if you have paid, you have access to more functionalities. So it's possible already now, you mean? Yeah, I mean, this is an iframe, right? You can do whatever yeah. you want, right? Uh, okay. It's but just that we don't say. Um, if you pay that much of EFR, or if you didn't select that much of EFR, uh, you don't have access to the plugin, right? Everything is decentralized, you just can use it. You can even get the source code, and uh, you can do it locally. You don't need to uh, bring it for that. So we want to manage the monetization. I mean, it's not on our roadmap, for sure. And uh, I don't think we are going to do it. We won't have it. We don't do it yet. Uh, yes. I don't know if anyone said it, but I looked at Remix a long time ago, and that's a significant upgrade from where it was. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we'll really hope that you can help us making it better. And Absolutely. Yeah, that's why we run for this discussion today, because uh, it's something that we want to increase, like in, uh, speaking with the community and know what you expect. And I really heard your, 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 your point about having more uh, view on what we're going to do uh, and your point to make it more organized because right now it's like we put our concept right. Do you think the point about making it more organized could just help us figure out what's, a, like, what's an important plugin to put in the list? Or is that just... Um... I think it's yes, to, cr it's to create structure to the process, then you can start create rules for the process. But it's just too much of an open, fluid conversation about what people want and you know, different communication channels for that. It can be difficult. And so you look at, say, the EIP process, or you look at, um, you know, I'm not sure how, like for example, like Apple Store, like there's all these very formal steps and pipelines to these processes. So you might learn from that. Coming from an outsider, because I'm not inside your team, I don't know. And, and, also, and that applies to both API and, uh, you know, when people submit requests to your project, right? Like, what principles are you yes. using to evaluate that for API changes and the plugin or participation? Participation. But the, the point of so we have this repository, uh, like Redis dash plugins, that try to test repository. And the point is 
just for people to compose APIs and and to, to reach the point where we will not be just citing all the API and everything. And for me, I, I, I kind of think I, I think it's a good thing, but at the same time, it will slow down everything. Yeah, yeah for sure. Then uh, we have to wait hours and weeks for uh, API to be approved or whatever. Yeah. Bureaucracy. The API. Yeah. Yeah. Your is a bureaucracy. <laughs> but at the same time, we have to do this. Yeah. If I know it's okay until you hit a, a threshold of this. So my, my, my point of view and personal is the, um, now it's a good time to build like a working group with some few people outside of Remix. So we can start having work on what should be added, uh, the roadmap on this kind of thing. On, um, we can work on, on this repository, it's really this, this place where we can all on this GitHub so every developer knows how it works. Um, and yeah, right now, and, and also have like discussion like uh, every two weeks or something like that, I think you call to know where we are going and uh, uh, this kind of thing. I really, I know that we're, we've seen the, the guys from Microsoft today and they really want to, uh, to do that also because they want, they, they, they might want to use this inside uh, VS Code. So um, if you want to be part of this working group that we are starting to, to build, uh, please come come and, and, and see us uh, just after that so we can uh, organize this. Working group, it can be like a ring in like uh, eight magicians and eight research. Like yeah, it could be also a ring to, to magicians, which like nice, yeah. Yeah. but focus on, focus on, on this subject. And, um, Maybe you have better experience than me. What would be the best like amount of people uh, to manage it at our very early stage? It's it's difficult with working groups because people might be enthusiastic at first, and then they might move on to other projects. The team really needs like a good organizer to constantly look after it and keep it going, and constantly ping the members and have phone call or conference calls and chat things like that. Mm -hmm. As you know, like your, you know, the, this, your community of people who are giving you feedback, you need an organizer. And what do you think, Nick? So you are doing this SPM mm -hmm. What do you think about it? what is your feedback? Or what? Um, I mean, in APM, I can't stop someone from. So we have like a federated registry, so model where everyone maintains their own on-chain registry. So there's no like one central registry. So it's. Trust is like all of it. It's like, um, I can't prevent anyone from releasing a malicious package. So it's just like the user has to trust the registry they're interacting with. And that's it. Um, I, I, like, I don't expect you guys to maintain the security of the plugins I interact with. Like, that's yep. on me. Um, I expect you guys more like if there's a broken one, I'd rather you guys like pull it or something. But if there's a malicious one, then like, yeah, I should, I should know. Yeah, yeah but what's the, the mechanism of knowing yeah. that? Yeah. Like, yeah. like we should There's help like each other knowing better. Yeah. Or it should be like metadata, like who who makes the, who maintains it, like give me a link to their GitHub or something. Give me a link to or like their Twitter handle. <laughs> you know, like in this space, everyone knows. Like there's something random. Use a report with another. We can we can improve your report directly from the link. Yeah. And but you guys review you. every plugin yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. How do you so, get someone to review it? I mean, someone needs to review it. You're right. I consider that you're right in the value zone. Like there are people using your tool to deploy family assets, corporate assets. Uh, I mean, even if, even if, you <laughs> if you if you can't inter if you don't know how to interact with blockchain, then like well people or don't. Well, yeah. Users don't. are putting huge value in, on this stuff. You have to assume the user doesn't isn't a total expert because they can just open up your tool, copy paste something, and put a multi sig in there and put the whole family. Well, then you put like a warning or something that guys, we have not reviewed yeah. this. If you don't know what you're doing, like go get someone who knows. Yeah, exactly. For for the beginning, I would stop. suggest a combination of what we have now and what what Probase was suggesting. So there would be maybe two buckets. Like one bucket is the trusted plugins for now. And then the other bucket would be like go and experiment on your own risk. 
maybe even two, three of them, I don't know, with the time, but still, it would be a good start payment. With red titles. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any style you would prefer. <laughs> I'd also be changing the subject slightly for the last couple of minutes. Um, also wanted to have a session of people coming up with the ideas for plugins. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, plugins like if there's a developer experience problem in the ecosystem that you think might be solved with a plugin. Can I change the font? Uh, <laughs> yeah. 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 That's a theme. But, but that does a plugin or? Yeah, it's a theme is a plugin. So it's not, it doesn't expose, like, uh, add a new theme yet, but uh, do it for request and I'll already do it. my font I like. <laughs> yeah, yeah also think that fonts. I want to have a right panel. In the right side, a panel. Ah, on the right side. Yeah, yeah. because right now you can only uh, position the plugin in the left side, uh, on yeah. the bottom. But one idea that I have is uh, I really would like to have a real-time storage visualizer. So like, I'm writing a contract deploying and, and I can immediately see how it's structured, like the slots and the body. So I mean, I think for learning purposes it would be really useful so people can immediately see what is happening. We just change the UI and you want us to go back to the previous one. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> I mean, I, I, yeah, I I see. It to, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, three minutes. Yeah, three minutes. Okay. And you have some. I wish this would take some time. I would like to ask you. Uh, useful for this kind of. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah maybe. Like, I mean, there is an update of patient, for example, the stuff you were saying, like, uh, not verified yet, but you can still uh, use the previous version, so the plugins which are like, verified through the Nice. And for, uh, Yes. Uh, making it like uh, close to be a full ID, like a, a desktop version with configuration files, with like uh, being able to use them in, in like a, in some way that it can be configured, and then whole team is just using the ID like an easily because now it's more like a web-based uh, one, which like I'm mostly using as if I need to experiment on something. But uh, we are not able to switch to Remix completely for our like. Uh, for development because of like, uh, but I'm not sure what is it now like at the state, but like uh, uh, having a configuration file for an ID which includes some like, uh, for, for example, check for a soul cover, etc., etc. Is it possible now with uh, <coughs> yeah. Remix or not? I'm not sure. Like, yeah, it is. It. But, uh, yeah, it is. So I think uh, we should discuss. Basically, the thing is that Remix was used like two years ago as learning platform. And it turns out that many people use it for live deployment, just for you writing. Can I use a Solium project? like a plugin and then have a configuration file on my like uh, disk and then the Remix will read this configuration file? Not and yet. Mm -hmm. but yes. Yes. Definitely, you can have like a plugin, and then you can. I mean, you could with Remix D connect to. Yeah, exactly. But that's already. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know it's a lot mean. of. Uh, yeah, that's what I mean. It's like a complicated, like a setup going through the Remix D to get. Yeah. And if it would be But the like thing is also yeah, friendly, to have access to the file system. But again, there is a lot of issues if Remix has access to the file system and will it expose it in the plugin API, then it's, it, it's not like just changing the, the, the code before deploying things. It's like changing the file system of the user mm -hmm. with the issues. Uh, so yes, but I don't know what are the security in VS code for that. And I they, they also have plugins, they have a review system in plugins. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. Do they have plugins? They don't have wallets. They don't, but they, they are using the mirrors with their for like a solid like a yeah, yeah. contract development. <laughs> so. Yeah, but that's the kind of thing we, we have to discuss with them. Sure. Yes. Yeah, like version control would be quite useful. You know? yeah. When I look at that, you know, you write some contract, then you go to GitHub and you change it there, or you have to go to local ID to change it. Yeah. She's <laughs> 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 uh, six months that she wants that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but perfect, thanks. <laughs> the issue itself is three years old or something like that, right? Uh -huh. The issue itself is three years old or something oh, like yeah. that. Tell him to let me do that. Okay, great. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.